Hi, everyone. This is Pino Trogu again from San Francisco State University, and this is the information design class. And um, this video is going to be uh, the paper companion to the screen uh, earlier video, um, meaning I'm going to be showing examples on, on print, on printed paper. So, uh, yeah, and uh, this is the uh, third part of the assignment, the first assignment of the spring um, 2021. And the third part is about cleaning up some of the graphs that we made in Excel, Tableau, or R. So what I did in that other video, I went through Illustrator, which was a little bit of a little bit of a torture for me, but um, and it's a little long, but you can jump ahead in that video. So in this video, instead, I'm just going to look at um, Anyway, and there we looked at how to fix the graphs, how to make them not just like the way they come out of the software, but a little more um, coherent and a little more standardized and a little more designed. Uh, so these are all, most of, yeah, all of these examples that I'm gonna show now um, are actually from the New York Times, which I think does an amazing job with their graphics. Um, Although once in a while they do have a few bloopers themselves, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a different uh, a different video. Um, so the first group was the line, right? And the things that I showed in the other video um, were very basic. So I'm going to go over them now, and I'm just going to point them out in the uh, in these examples, okay? And perhaps I have a piece of paper that I can sort of sketch. So that you can yeah so for the line graph um the the way the program will spit out you know your graph right is that often they'll put you know perhaps a label here that says you know so these might correspond to that line. These might correspond to that line. There'll be a color here and a color there, okay? So instead of having these labels here next to the lines, there'll be just something here. And you can imagine with like six lines, you might have a legend that reads like this, right? So that color, that color, that color, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to constantly jump back and forth, back and forth between the line and the legend. And why have a legend if you can just label the, um, lines themselves um, right next to it. And typically that's a good spot right at the end, especially if they're, if they are, um, you know, far, far enough apart. Now, if they're not, you can see what they're doing here. They're just putting a little dot and showing, okay, which one is actually above um, or below, just very close, right? These are both 3%, but if you look closely, there's a slight difference anyway. The main point being is that you can eliminate the legend, okay, or the key, whatever you might want to call this. Um, and uh, let's see, other things that we did was that we made all the type 100% K, okay, no screens. And since we're talking about that, I'll just quickly show you an example of what I mean. Um, you know, on screen, of course, you'll see perfectly beautiful gray type, whether it's 80%, 60%, it looks always very nice and very solid. But what happens in fact in print um, is that unless you're using a special color, unless you're using a spot color of gray, um, your type will get a little bit messed up. Well, sometimes a lot messed up, especially if it's small and if it's light, light. So if you use a vertical light, very small, that particular line will have this problem that while on the screen, um, you'll see a nice gray like that, right? This will be a solid gray in print because you're only using black, your line might look something like this, okay? Which has to do with the screen ruling of the printed piece, which could be higher or lower depending on the quality of the paper and a lot of other factors, okay? So this is what you see, right? But this is what you get. And, the, and just to illustrate that, um, I can't zoom in 
it, it's going to go out of focus. Let me see if I do. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, that works quite well. I love this. Look at that. Okay, yeah. So you can see that's maybe 50% gray. And what's happening is that the type is being broken up um, because there is no gray. There is no gray ink in CMYK. It's either black or no black. And when you do that, here's what happens. These are just a series of zooming in into that particular spot. Um, and as you zoom in, as you zoom in, that's what you're going to get, right? So that's not so great. You might say, well, who cares? It, it does matter. Sometimes things become illegible. Um, on the other hand, if you had, uh, now I put away the book. Um, actually, I'll pause this for a moment. Okay, yeah, so what I was saying is if you have CMYK, you only have black, you don't have gray. So in order to get gray, you have to do this kind of trick, right? Which is not great. Notice how also this particular page has a very light um, gray background, which because it's printed really, really well, you get away, you know, making it really, really smooth. But that's what's happening. On the other hand, if you had the luxury of having a gray color to print, a spot color, um, this, I'll show you this example, um, which is from a beautiful book by a good friend of mine from Milan, um, Mauro Panzeri. So this book is about actually door handles <laughs> in America. It's not a big deal because all the doors have round knobs, which is silly. But um, so this book is printed in CMYK, right, for these color pictures. Um, but it's also printed with an additional gray for these line, line reproductions, for example. And that gray is also used in some of the photos, which are duotones, which extends actually the range of the values of the, of the grays in the pictures. And so here, um, if I zoom in here, you will see that this is gray type, but this is not gray type made up of black dots, it's actually gray ink that was printed, meaning that, let's see if we can go in there. Yeah, there we go, right, this is actually nice. So there is no screen there. I mean, there's a little bit of the texture of the paper, but that's, um, that doesn't matter because this is offset, okay? So what you, if you had, if you didn't have the gray ink, this is how it would look on the computer, but this is not how it would get um, printed. Right. So just the brief discussions about CMYK versus versus um, spot colors. Um, and since we're talking about type and how we can get messed up, let me just quickly show you one other thing. Uh, because these days design is so dependent on the computer that I think some designers who haven't had to do stuff like by hand don't quite you know, understand that once it gets on paper, it's very different from the computer. So this is a book that actually everybody talks about in our department. And there's been talk about actually adopting it as a textbook, or maybe it already is in some classes. And I think it's a pretty good book. It's a, whatever, 100 methods of design. Um, lots of research and everything. And I read some parts of it, but I only read some parts because it's impossible to read because the typography, it's so thin, the type, even though it is black, black type. Where is my loop? Here it is. Um, okay, look how beautiful that looks right there. But and so it's a very light, meaning light in terms of the weight of the type face. It's also sans serif, which makes it a little hard to read, harder to read for text, for long texts. And the overall feel of the page um, is super, super light. I mean, now my exposure is a little bit light on the computer too, on the, on the camera too. But let me just show you a... kind of a contrast between the two, okay? And this is also very reflective. Um, anyway, this is a book, or it's a different kind of book, but notice how, I'm having a little hard time, it's a little again overexposed, 
but the value of the right page is much darker, right? So there is a there is a certain threshold that you shouldn't go below, which means don't make the paper just stay white. You have to give it some um, some grayness. It's actually called the color of the page, even though it's black and white. Um, so this is a book by Robin Kinross, who is a fantastic typographer and publisher in, in London. Um, and this is a book, I believe the person who wrote this book actually designed it. So I basically said to my students, I'll never read this book because there's no way I can. I can. It's just too taxing on your, on, on your eyes. Um, so, so much about gray type, too much perhaps. Let's move forward with these uh, graphs. And let's see. Well, maybe I can show you how sometimes you can get gray by, uh, yeah, there you go. I think you can see it. You see those lines are basically little dots. I'm not sure how we can make those in Illustrator without going through a lot of trouble, but um, so at the New York Times, they know that when they print, the paper is very, it absorbs the ink very fast. So it has to be uh, black. It has to, it can't be just fuss around with, you know, two little details. Um, and the New York Times, believe it or not, in some plants where they print a newspaper, they still can't do full color on every page. So that's why some pages um, are always black and white. Also because they want to make it the same throughout the United States. So even though some plants can print all color, because some can't, they'll just keep it to the, to the more common uh, denominator. Anyway, here's another example of basically putting your labels at the end of the lines or wherever they fit, right? Again, why have labels somewhere else and then having to go back and forth? Um, these are combined with some, let's see, this is about the, the stimulus bills. Yeah, relative to COVID. And this is already getting into layout, right? And, and seeing how perhaps you can tell a story by organizing your material um, in such a way that, for example, here it's combining a timeline, right? Longitudinal data for, let's see, average wage income of the top 1% right here. And it shows basically how since 2013, you know, it did kind of go down a little bit, but then it went really way up. Whereas here, um, it's about productivity, which kept going up and up and up throughout these years, again, from the 50s, in this case, to the teens. But wages, uh, the hourly compensation basically stayed flat. Oh, I only had these three examples. Okay, good. So let's pick now um, we got bars. By the way, bars and columns is what I think Excel really makes a distinction. So in Excel, I think if you if you have this kind of graph, it's called the bar graph. And if you have this kind of graph, it's called a column chart, a column. And I guess this makes sense, right? Because these columns do go usually just up and down. Bars, on the other hand, you know, you could have them going both ways. But the first bar chart was indeed horizontal. Okay. In the 18 something, 50 maybe. Um, Okay, so one thing we did, I did show in the, uh, in the Illustrator thing is that if you have graphs that relate to each other, you should always try to keep the scales consistent, right? So all these graphs, which are about different states, uh, yeah, this is actually about COVID, deaths of COVID. This is back from May 7th, um, so nine months ago, I guess. Um, but anyway, this is really important, right? That these scales are always the same because you know you could see how I could enlarge this to be this big and it wouldn't make any sense. 
Um, so once again, if we look at how it's printed, um, those really nice dots and you see how the type is black, nice and crisp. Um, another quick typography note is that you should really, this is less about data visualization, more about just printing technology and typography. You should have a type gauge, everyone. If you are in the letterpress class, and I know these, these days it's also via the screen, uh, you would have this ruler, which is a, a type gauge or a printer's ruler that has picas. And there's about six picas to an inch and 12 points to a pica. And I'm just gonna show you a quick trick because I think it's neat. Um, and also refer to printed things to see how things look like in real life. I'm gonna have, actually, that's a good point. I'm gonna have in the neck, in this particular assignment, a bar, like a control bar that I'm gonna ask you to put, well, I shall give it to you. Um, that's gonna have six inches, kind of like a yardstick. And I will, as, you know, I'll ask you to put it in there and then you can test on the screen when you zoom in and you zoom out, whether, you know, take a ruler and say, oh, okay, is that really six inches now on the screen? Because when you do full size on the screen, it's not gonna give you full size like it would be in real life. It depends on the resolution and whatnot. So right now, if I do full size on my screen, the, um, a bar that's five inches of my design, six inches may look really like four inches because my resolution is really high. So this will be a good control. Um, okay, the trick I was gonna show you is that you should be able to tell what type, when you have a type, a text block, how big it is. And it's gonna be tricky to tell exactly what type size it is, but you can say very definitely what is the combination of the type and the line spacing, okay? Meaning when we set type, we might say, oh, okay, it's 12 on 13, right? So that means it's 12 point type plus one point spacing or leading or line spacing, okay? Whatever you wanna call it. But this number tells you the distance between each line. And the easiest way to measure that is between the baseline of one line and the baseline of the other. But here, because it's small, there is no way of telling what that is exactly, right? You can't measure it. But you can do this, you can count 12 lines. Because it's base 12, you can then determine. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna count and I'm gonna skip the first. So I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So from there to there, I'm gonna measure that. And it's a little over focus now, but that's eight and a half picas. Okay. So this is 8.5 picas, which means that this number in this system is gonna be 8.5. So it means that this type is actually something over eight and a half. And to figure out what that might be, I go a little closer and I say, okay, let me look at an ascender and a descender, right? Let me look at it, maybe the G and a T that are, you know, there you go. Okay, so if you look at, the, at that uh, G and B right there in the middle, you can see there is a little bit of room there. So I'm gonna guess it's either a point, but maybe even half a point. So what I can say with fairly accurateness is that this type is probably eight point over eight and a half, okay? So that's just a little trick. Count 12 lines, uh, measure them. And again, the best way to measure would be from baseline to baseline. However you wanna do it, you're gonna get picas that number actually is the then points for this second element in this calculation. Okay. Uh, this I showed in the uh, screen version of this video. 
where we put white lines on top of the bars instead of having, uh, in this case, we have basically dotted lines on top, but because they're so light, they work very well there as well. Uh, but here to make the graph a little more graphic, this was the front page. Um, we put white lines on top and by putting them all across, because the rest of the background is white, it won't look like that. It won't look like there's a line there. It will just look like there is little tick marks according to the bars, you know, according to that, to that particular spot. And another detail that they did here, which I believe it's a nice touch, has to do with the fact that they used a line graph at the bottom. Well, this is about, yeah, about Wall Street. So they used a line graph and they filled in the negative territory and the positive territory. A negative again, uh, here's the white line again. And they highlighted the line with a darker brown, right? So by doing that, now they're carrying that over. Again, it's a really nice touch um, because they added to the bars and this goes off the page here. Yeah, and you can see how that of course is rendered in terms of the CMYK, right? So this is a very nice way to do the grid lines. Okay. More bars, you, can, you know, they can be really, really small, right? I mean, we're talking about, you know, quarter inch. So right there, there's a little graph, that little portion there from the eighties, whatever that is, yeah, unemployment. Um, there you go, it fits in a quarter inch and there's a lot of information right there, right? So don't be afraid to make things sometimes small. Um, I'm trying to find some great type, but I can't for some reason. Oh, by the way, in terms of the layout, I'll show this. this is actually really nice because it was literally off the chart, right? So it starts at the top and this was in April of last year. It just goes and goes and goes until it gets to the bottom of the page. So I'm gonna step back from the camera so I can show you how that works. Right, so the entire um, the entire graph becomes the page. So you can take advantage sometimes of, in this case, just knocking out one column from the from the layout and using that for that bit. Which is another way to say that graphs don't have to be um, don't have to be sort of protected zones, so to speak. So if I have a graph like this in the New York Times that goes like this, right? It doesn't mean that this area shouldn't be used for something else. In this case, text, you could even put maybe a, yet another graph there, right? As long as it doesn't interfere, as long as the coordinate system is not screwed up. Um, okay, so remember you can put text, right? You can add other things. Uh, this is also particularly true of the scatter plot, which we'll see in a moment. You know, you can always put information. It's much harder to do it, um, well, to do it on top of the bars if the if the uh, the bar fills up most of the space. Although they still manage to do it here. Just make sure I'm still recording. Yeah, I was paranoid that somehow it's not going. Um, okay, this is, I think I'm going backwards now in time. Yeah, this is basically the same. Um, no, this is actually food sales, retail and food sales. Okay, but similar idea, right? And this is now in March. So that's the month before. Um, there is something, again, these are really sad stories, of course, because it's COVID, but, but in terms of layout and in terms of graphics, there's something really, I think, beautiful about some kind, you know, there's a parallelism here between this title, all caps, so all strokes, and then these little bars, right? The strokes are like basically the same thickness as the bar. 
I just noticed that there's, you know, it just works. Um, and yet it's not, it's not trying to be fancy or, or clever. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so this is now going forward to July and this is about economic growth in general. And here, let's see what they did. I think the lines are gray. Oh, actually, no, look at that. They're still made up of little dots. Actually, no, they are gray. I mean, they're, they're dots in the sense that they're, they're not single dots in a line. They're more like um, screened lines. Okay, so that's for the... Um, oh, one thing I should mention, just because it's very important, is that never put your labels sideways because that's how they come out um, from the program. But uh, a simple one. Yeah. So in this here, you know, these are the cases, right? Right. So four thousand, whatever, three thousand. So new corona case, coronavirus cases. Now you wouldn't say, you know, coronavirus cases here, right? But that's how the program might do it. So just move that, take that, flip it and put it horizontally somewhere. You can put it on top of the graph right here. It's okay. The horizontal of course is no, no problem. So that was the bar. Now let's get to the scatter plot, which, if you follow my previous uh, videos, I guess, um, especially my introduction, is really the best, um, the best graph in many ways because it combines at least two variables. So if you have two bar charts, you can combine them you know, with different coordinates and get to something like this, which I did show earlier. If you recall, this was the uh, a scatter plot showing how in the long run, um, an electric car, even though it's more expensive when you buy it than a gas car, it's gonna cost you pretty much the same um, when you divide the total cost spread out per year over, you know, 10 years or whatever, okay? So this was uh, emissions, I believe, yeah. Oh, and this was comparing, yes. Um, uh, comparing emissions and cost per month. And if you recall, Tesla was here. Nissan was one of the best, I mean, uh, Leaf. And then uh, one of the worst was the Tundra right here. And these are grouped by whether they're hybrids, electric, diesel, or gas. And then there was yet another little graph that was actually um, another little scatter plot that showed really, um, Let's see, Nissan and Altima, yeah, it's it's kind of combining them. Now we don't see it in the other one, but um, yeah, so this just shows that. When you look at the cost, right, the Tesla and the Nissan Altima are in the same range when you figure, you know, over time even though Tesla produces, you know, when you consider manufacturing of the batteries, you know, all those things produces less than half of, of um, carbon dioxide. In the assignment itself, I'll put some links to some uh, tutorials of how, in this case, this is how to do a, a, a scatter plot in R and then uh, take Illustrator to clean it up. Um, uh, remember also that in a scatter plot, we haven't done it yet, but you can do two variables. You can actually do three variables. 
So one is X, one is Y, right? So some value for that. But there is a third value, which is impossible on the paper to show in terms of dimension because you don't have the Z dimension, but you can show that by making dots, you know, more or less uh, big, right? Like that. So you have one variable, another variable, and then you have this variable, which is the size of the circle. And in this scatter plot, it's showing, um, this is crime, burglary rates this way, and murder rates this way. And these are the different states for a particular year. And then um, we added the population. Now, in this case, the population is not such a great measure of anything because of course a big state is going to have a bigger bubble however what's you know what's important really is uh, the rate right so this is per 100,000 population murders burglaries per 100,000 population i mean you could maybe get some some maybe you know deduct something from meaning figure out something based on the population but it's really pretty arbitrary so only do that if there is a there's a good reason. Um, so, okay, the connected scatter plot. I didn't show it in the in the screen version of the assignment, but you did you did have to do it, right? And so this is um, again one of one of my favorites because again the line is the years, and the years sometimes seem to loop around, and it, it's just very unusual. Um, this is showing. Uh, miles, yeah, driven per capita and all the automobile fatalities can go in this way. And it shows how they went up. Let's see, yeah, they went up in the 60s, probably because no seat belts and more people were driving. And then it went down, um, probably because of the introduction of seat belts. And it's been going down since. And this is from 2012, so eight years ago. Already it looked like there was a new trend that it was actually starting to come up. And if you look at recent data, it has come up again. And one of the big reasons is actually texting, turns out. Um, uh, a few things I should point out here, uh, beautiful little, little mini stories, you know, storytelling of our, about a particular section used almost as like an initial cap in these paragraphs. So this one is referring to this little bit right here. This one is referring to that little bit right here. You see these little arrows pointing there. Uh, very, very nice. So actually, again, this is a little bit out of focus, but you can see it's highlighting this, this part of the map. And this is called the annotation layer, where you actually tell a story by annotating the different parts of the graph. Uh, and even the article itself fits inside the graph because nothing happens between, you know, 20. 20 fatalities per 100,000 and, you know, whatever, 6,000 miles driven. All right. so another really nice graph from, you know, it looks like the, a long time ago, this is 2011 before Obama tried to get reelected and it's showing uh, what states in this, in this middle area here, Obama uh, should get in order to win a second term, okay? The variables are, there's three variables. Well, one is not a variable it's because it's the uh, electoral uh, weight of each state, electoral votes for each state. And that's the size of the circle. So California, of course, in this case is bigger because more electoral votes. Um, the red are the ones that voted for, um, for McCain in the previous election. The blue are the ones that voted for, um, for Obama. And it's pointing out, okay, which ones does it need to get again? The main point of this graph is actually showing how more educated electorate votes Democrat and less educated electorate votes Republican. It's based on percentage with bachelor's degree or higher among those 25 and, and older, okay? So this is going this way, it's how many people have a college degree. And this is um, the margin of victory, 20%, 40%, et cetera. Um, and so, 
yeah, basically saying, okay, that's what Obama is going to need. But the striking thing, of course, not so much about the election is, but it shows, yeah, which are the states that have a higher percentage of college educated people. Massachusetts is the highest. This is off the chart again, because it's an outlier, because it's just a city. Um, what's striking even more though, is that, what is that percentage? So Massachusetts is maybe 40%. But look at Arkansas, Kentucky, Missouri, 20%. Um, and it's, I mean, it's pretty clear, right? I mean, there's obviously a trend line there, some kind of story. Um, a scatter plot is more abstract. I mean, there's no question about it because it's asking you to make connections between parts that are not, um, in a sense, kind of tangible. Um, like a bar is so it's easier to say oh that's how much it is it's like so tall so wide so filled um, but it is more informative um, this is a scatter plot about the percent the margin of victory in the popular vote and the margin of victory in the uh electoral college okay and this is old again you know bush was for a long time, the only one that actually got fewer votes, but still won. And now, of course, I don't know, Trump is probably right there somewhere. Um, and this is an illustrated version that I recreated, and there is a tutorial about this actually from the original that was in the New York Times. And in this case, you know, the color do define Republican Democrats. Sometimes colors shouldn't be used because they're only going to get people confused. But we accept that red is Republican and, and blue is Democrat. So it's easy to remember that. OK, just a few others about sports, because maybe some of you like baseball. I don't know. I'm not. I don't know much about it, although I like going to the games when, when they have games. Um, this is showing, OK, how much are heaters, you know, sluggers, I guess, worth? And it's showing, let's see, I think average salary is here, average hits uh, in 2013 from zero to 140. And so, based on these two divisions, and this is the salaries 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. And this guy, Alex Rodriguez, I don't know, I guess he got hurt or something, but. He had zero hits, and yes, and yet he was the most expensive player. Um, so you would say these are the best deals, right? Lots of hits, only two and a half million, right? Right there. Uh, somewhere here, a little more fair, you know, five million, quite a bit of hits um, here too, right? But all these are kind of not very good deals. Um, okay. Let's see, last two, um, this is the same about the moving years. And this is about the way the production of oil going this way and the price of oil going this way. And these are just different years and it's a little hard to follow here, but um, it just shows how, you know, price goes up, production is maybe less. And now here it's both production and price go down. And this again, it's 2015. Um, the last one, I'll make a note. If you have a chance, please go see um, that movie with that TED talk with, um, let's see, another piece of paper with uh, Hans Rosling, the author of that book that I showed at the beginning uh, of the semester. Um, which is a scatter plot that shows uh, an animated scatter plot with a with a cursor that you can move that shows let's say income i believe and uh longevity and uh life expectancy okay and you can see how the different countries did over the years okay moving up and up and up and no country right now i believe is below 50 50 years in expectancy uh, so most country have risen from that you know threshold um, but the article here which is from 
uh, and read it down. Oh yeah, 2010 uh, traces those paths. Okay, so again, this is money. How much people make? Oh, actually, gross domestic product. So this is actually the country as a whole, and this is expectancy, right? Eight years, 80 years, 70 years, and you will see the China from 1990. Okay to 2008, so in just 18 years, their life expectancy went up by five years, which is a ton. You can see from all the other lines that while income has, grow, has grown, I'm sorry. Um, that actually life expectancy has grown, but income is not. So anyway, each one of these is like a mini story. Um, and again, that website, so Hans Rosling, and he, he did this software called Gapminder. And I think the website now is maybe gapminder.org, I'm not sure. Uh, but there's a, a TED talk, which is really, really, really great. Uh, so take a look at it, okay? All right, great. This is it for this video, and I'll put uh, all the additional information in the uh, the assignment itself. Okay, thank you.